Asian. Everybody stop. There it is. Hello, everybody. Now you can start again. <laughs> <laughs> but Mike, what a nice um, example of the use of those Google tabs. The color and you've color coded them and everything. Nice example. modeling for us. Thank you, Karen. I am quite the model we should all strive to be. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. I don't know if that's what you were saying, Karen, but that's what I took from Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. We're going back to the brilliance part. Multiple tabs is brilliant. Shocking. As soon as you hit record, Murata, the compliment comes out. And now uh, I love record. that she waited until, until the hit record got hit and then complimented me. This is great. Oh, I love it. All right. So if you're new to us, welcome. Uh, I don't know if anybody is, but Alyssa seems to think we might have new people, so that's a good thing. Uh, this is our weekly town hall. Here it is. Uh, as you can guess, if you've been here in the past couple minutes before record got pressed, uh, it's a pretty loose conversation. Uh, it's a pretty casual group, uh, and we have a very small plan for the time together. A very small plan, um, but I think it'll be a good plan. We don't need to see that. Um, I did want to remind people that we do have another uh, unconference coming up that our agency is hosting, which happens on March 6th. So not this weekend coming up, but the following weekend uh, from 9 to 12 Eastern in the morning. I didn't put Eastern there, sorry. Uh, and it'll be free and it'll be an unconference and we'll come up with ideas beforehand and fill in a schedule and we'll just have conversations uh, related to technology and people with disabilities and education and anything else you want to talk about. So there's the link to sign up. This is, we're getting dangerously close to the end of my prepared information here, which is great. Went for exactly four or five slides. Don't forget to participate. Uh, this is really more of a conversation than anything else. Thank you, Kelly, for putting that in the chat. So I popped up, thank you. Hey, Mike, can I can I make a shout out to Lisa? Uh, I used to join your um, this group when you first started, and um, I got sidetracked with all things AT at work. And um, I saw her tweet yesterday. And since I went to the ATIA session on all kinds of social media, that's now brought me back. So, Lisa, thank you. You are quite good welcome. Good job. We are yeah. Go Gators. To, I decided we'd double team it, not knowing, yeah, exactly, not knowing <laughs> when um, when Mike's tweet would come out. I figured, like, uh, uh, you know, how I used to set alarms sometimes for, like, 12 hours and then, mm -hmm. like, an hour before and then a I figured maybe we'd try that route and see what happened. I like it. I well, didn't it worked. It this morning, but yeah. yes, thank you. That's always nice to get multiple ideas. I've been trying over the past couple of weekends to not do any work on the weekend. So I've been trying to purposely stay off Twitter and staying off my email. Um, but I did see it this morning. So thank you. Good for you. Has Good. anyone removed their email from their phones? I don't, yeah, I don't have my work email on my phone. Um, mm -hmm. I had to reset my phone and um, every once in a while, it's kind of painful um, where I'm like, oh, I could, oh, no, no, no. So, I mean, I still have an iPad, so it's not like the end of the world, but, um, but my personal phone does not have my school system email on it. I still have access to my calendar because it's shared to my personal Gmail. Mm -hmm. um, that was my concession. So um, it is nice because like, I don't have, like, if I am on my phone, like there's no like maybe I'll just open and send one real quick or what, I can't do it. It was That's a, a great idea. <laughs> That's a great idea. I was at the CAMI conference the other day and their opening speaker talked about taking objects. And one of the objects he gives uh -huh. all his staff uh -huh. is a light switch from the dollar store. And he says, you have to turn off your professional brain and you get like use that as a visual wow. reminder. But I not having that. it on the phone is great too. Yeah, so I mean, I still have, and I mean, in truth, I have like the side projects, the passion projects emails still on my phone, but I don't have the the Monday through Friday job email on my phone. And I, that was, I, as I was getting ready to go back adding them, I've been thinking like all the times we've talked about like separation and trying to, and I was like, okay, here's a really like permanent no we'll see how permanent it is but like permanent separation I could make a physical separation so like I have to put in extra effort to go get an iPad versus if I'm just like sitting on the couch with my phone or out someplace um, it has it has helped um, and I don't feel like I've missed any 
you know, like, oh my gosh, somebody emailed me. Cause I, I will check it Monday through Friday on my iPad, but if it's Saturday, like, is there like, I'll check it Sunday night, but is there anything that could possibly come in on an email that is like world ending that I need to know about on a Saturday or Sunday? That's yeah, the trick. My problem is just being able to, I, I'm, I'm finding, and I think part of it is just the, the fact that we, it's not as easy to go out with the pandemic and the colder weather and, and all of that. I, I'm just finding it's really hard. I mean, I did that like this weekend, I truly didn't have any work I had to do. It wasn't about checking or not checking my email. It was about sustaining my attention just to a book and, you know, wanting to kind of like do that. And I just, I had a really hard time with it. And I'm, I would love some strategies for just like, how do people disconnect their brain when it's all like your life. I, I'm not, I could, you know, in another time I would have been like calling up someone and been like, all right, come on, we got to go, you know, get some coffee together or something. I can't. I'm not that. laughing at you, Beth. I'm laughing at Rachel's answer in the, in the chat. Was uh, Oh, I know. She's <laughs> alcohol. alcohol. <laughs> I mean, I was trying to avoid that until like four, but I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, then seriously, like I had such a hard time. I actually like purposefully didn't have, I was so excited this weekend because I didn't have work to do. I'm all about, I really am all about self-care. I mean, I walk every day. I, I have a book I listen to. I have a book I read and I just couldn't disconnect my brain from it from needing to have something to do. So was it just this instance or is that like a over time you're noticing it's harder yes. and harder to do? I think it's the over time thing. And I think, again, I think part of it is that inability to just sort of, um, everything is happening in the same space. So it's just always there, right? I was gonna say, is it because you're not moving to an, like to me, it's about creating a different space. Like I try to do all my work in my home office. So when I leave my home office, it's like leaving my work, like creating a separate space for yourself where and I, like I, you have a little book nook, you have a little whatever. Yeah, I have my basement office and I really don't go down here on the weekends if I can avoid it. And well, does it stress you, Beth? Are you dissatisfied? I mean, sometimes no, I just very, I just love very, what we do. I think I've just become more ADHD as an adult than I was as a kid in my, in my geriatric years. So could you set smaller goals? Like instead of, I'm going to sit here for an hour and read this book, like, could you, could you go back and be like, I'm going to, even if you have to break out the timer, like, you know, I'm going to read for 15 then it's like slowly building up your tolerance. Yeah. Like tolerance so seems like a weird word for like tolerance for self-care, but I feel like maybe that's, Pomodoro right. method in yes. exactly. Yeah. exactly. I feel like it's also um, like it's a me versus them. Like if it's a me thing, like if I like listening to the podcast or I like and I feel relaxed reading, then it's like for me. So it's more self care or like I picked it. But like me answering somebody else's email is because of something they need. So that's how I kind of divide it. I'm like, email is not like ever for me, really. I mean, unless I need to like send my boss something like mostly it's just me answering and responding to everybody else. So other. All the other fun stuff is like the purpose is like for me because I want to learn it or I enjoy listening to this, I don't know, Ted talk or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Beth, do you think it was the medium? Do you think it was the book because it was a book and not a podcast or something? Like it just to like, do we need to switch to audiobooks because that holds your attention better? Yeah, I really or? think it was probably like the book wasn't just it just I I'm like part of it was like I probably just needed to pick like a different book to read and I just give myself permission to say like abandon that book and like I don't have to fit. I mean it was believe me it was nothing the least bit intellectual, um, <laughs> but. <laughs> That sounds perfect, That's, actually. Right. It wasn't engaging enough. Like it wasn't, right. it wasn't engaging enough. Whereas I actually had had a book that I had read the week before that was way more engaging and harder to put down. So I just needed to, I just needed to do that. Now, if I was sitting outside, part of it too, if I was sitting outside, the sunshine relaxes me, having to sit inside was part of it. But I think it is. I think it's just important that we give ourselves, you know, like those things and hearing what other people are doing. I like Kelly's, I like Kelly's um, response, uh, but I'm, I'm going for waiting until 
I'm going for a couple more years. We're planning the wedding and, and I, I want to move to Alabama before, before my daughter has her grandbabies. Not like I have any control over it though. <laughs> but yeah, definitely. I agree. I mean, Kelly, I did the same thing. Like I have my work email, I have my personal email and then I have my like other projects email and at like AOTA listserv and the quiet listserv all go to one email that isn't my, because then I can go back and search it. I can reference it. I can reply if there's something that pops up, but it's not. Otherwise it would be like, I mean, my inboxes are already crazy. I think we talked before yeah. about <laughs> my goal is inbox 150. <laughs> I'm yeah, you know, at that. And I think I was thinking about the phone because my work email is on my phone. And at the same time, if I get a notification, I can't stand the numbers that pop up. So I have to look. So I think small steps, like now as hearing you all talk, I should just turn off the notifications. So then you don't even know they're popping up oh, yeah. and that may help getting used to that because, you know, there's anxiety about that little pop up. Yeah. Like you've got 25 emails you're like <gasps> and you feel like you have to look at them even though it's on a Saturday and that's just it's that's not good and yeah. I think and it's something the rest is don't push the email like make it so it doesn't like automatically like you have right. to go into your email and do it and then you're like oh right. now I'm ready and now I'll do yeah. it I'm in a and space you know, on but, Sunday afternoon where like, I just want to check and make sure, does anybody really need something before yeah. Monday? Then you can go in and do it. And again, like when I took it off my phone, like I really rarely have a place where I'm not within arm's reach of an iPad. Like, can mm -hmm. I go do it? Yes. But it, it, it gives me that like second pause to think like, do I really uh, need to mm -hmm. go do it right well, now? And, and you have to think about it. There's really no excuse because there's even the big pause your email on your Gmail that you can just click on a, when you leave Friday mm -hmm. and then turn it back on on Monday. Then the thought of coming back in Monday and having like a hundred emails. <laughs> it's a different kind of stressor. But again, I think like society somewhere along the way tried to convince us that mm -hmm. we have to be available seven days a week. And, yeah. and I think it's frustrating, you know, in that regard to think like, like, how do you do your job effectively if you are available seven days a week? I don't think you can. And, and I mean, like, yes, if you're a doctor and you work weird shifts and you work seven days, yes. But like, I think everybody has to have that, that mental space, if not the physical space, because we don't really have that as much if you're working from home, but like the mental space and the permission to mm -hmm. just be like, I'm going to just, I'm not going to look at a work anything on all day Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I think I've been, trying like, to, I've been trying to pick one day on the weekend, like either Saturday or Sunday. And I I've accepted that I, I will do work for two hours from like nine to 11. Cause then, then I feel like it's, done. it's confined to the morning and then I still have the whole rest of the day, but it's one or the other. And then I've been doing that same thing where I'll turn notifications off on my phone on Friday. I'll just mm -hmm. turn them off and then I'll turn them back on on Monday morning. And I think Kelly, if you do it like two weekends in a row and you realize like the world didn't end, like, I think some of that, and I'm being serious, like the anxiety will kind of decrease yeah. of like, you know, yes, you can check it Sunday night. And honestly, anybody who really needs me, they've got my Google voice number and they're going to text me or call me. Like, so to me, if my boss is trying to get me or one of my therapists, cause they've got, you know, at this point, it's usually I've been exposed to COVID. What do I do? Contact. And those are important conversations to have on the weekend. But like, once you do it and then you realize once or twice, like you have that learned experience of like, this wasn't the end of the world. And on the flip side, like that was actually kind of good for my mental space. I could come back on a Monday and be a little bit fresh and ready to handle whatever came. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've done the same thing that Cassie's doing now. I've, I've went back to making reading more of a habit. Um, when I traveled, it was a habit because I was just always traveling and always reading anyway. Um, but then it stopped being a habit. And I, and I decided to push, push through and get that back on track. And I've given myself permission to not read things for work. And it's okay. Yeah. Like I would usually go and read a pleasure book the trashier, the better, the stupider, the better. And then I would read a workbook right after it. And then I would go back and forth. And now I have a stack of workbooks over here on the side of my desk. I haven't touched in months and they're just sitting there. Um, but I've, I've read tons of trashy nonsense novels though. And they're great. Yeah. Have you guys seen that? And I'd have to go find it. Um, 
that like read it like track your books that you've read all year picture where you like write the title or whatever um I think that's one of the few things I would do paper pencil like when Cassie held up her planner I was like paper planner Hmm. I like the idea of it I do it on goodreads that's what I do Uh, do it on goodreads too yeah um and for me actually I am I'm always I, I'm always reading. I have to be reading. It's more like it was for me, it was like, and I'm always reading an earbook, a professional book, and a printed text book. Doesn't, it might be on my, it's usually, I mean, it might be on my iPad or Kindle or whatever, or it might be mm-hmm. paper, but um, it for me, it, it just recently was more that att- being able to sustain attention. And um, I know, like, I won't have any problem you know, sitting on the beach in a week, um, reading uh, a book, yeah. reading a book for eight hours, like, you know, that'll be fine. But I think it's that, it's that need to, you know, I think we're all in that. I think I hear that from other people too, you know, what kinds of ways do we sort of get out of our heads as we're moving through everything that we are in right now. And I, I felt this way a year ago, like last March basically is kind of, I started feeling that way. And then I moved out of it and we had summer and it was, you know, and it was fall and it was nice. It was like, you know, you could get out of your head a little bit more. And now we're back in like, you know, now that we've been back in heavy duty winter, especially where I am, the snow has been, ugh. um, so I think it is, is it is a, a part of it. Um, I wanted to share something while we were like talking about reading professional books, like, um, Alyssa and I, like Alyssa knows my post-it obsession. Um, and this is actually not a post-it one, so don't tell my brother who works for 3M. Mm. Um, but these are like, they're post-it tabs. So like you can use them in books. So they have that tab that sticks out, but it also has a whole page of lines. So for when you like want to read, want to write notes, but you don't want to write in your book for whatever reason, I'm like so excited about these right now to do my annotations, have it be tabbed. But um, I found them on Amazon. I was gonna say I'm gonna give you a link to the one that. Um, Good, thank that you. I'm just gonna look them up. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, these are by Ready Tag, and I yep. don't think I even realized it that it wasn't um, <laughs> posted because I usually my brother works for 3M, so I try to stay with the actual name brand. But. <laughs> and then, do you take pictures of them and save them to Google Keep? Um, it depends on what it is. Sometimes with like, I mean, a book that I like a book that I'm going to keep and that, that I have in print and it, like I have you know this is all full of tabs like I've got tab tab tabs and then I have ones that I started right what I realized is I was like using the little flags but then I was putting other sticky notes in because I didn't want to mark or I couldn't mark it up that much or whatever so not necessarily but that would certainly be something for a student to be able to do if they needed to have that like let's say they were reading a school owned book and they needed to take the notes and, in it and still have it tabbed so it was easy to find. And I like the fact that these are color coded. So that's a strategy I often tell people is color code certain things um, with the, you know, with the different color post-its, you know, so. And that's actually how I discover them because I teach most of my middle schoolers that have any kind of executive functioning, anything, we use one color coding system. And I have some teachers that have bought into it, whole hook, sink, line, and everything. Yeah. Um, so like yellow are important dates and orange. And that's whether you're in social studies or you're in science or wherever. And these, I was looking for something that was like, we were basically making a version of this with a post-it note and with a hefty tab. And I was like, surely somebody out there has already made something and when we found these um they work because they're a they're color coded and b it's really nice then as a as a return learning feature for a student to be able to just really quickly like that whatever they write on that side tab you know wherever it's positioned in the book they can flip really quickly to it it was really great forget what novel the student was reading but for like when they were doing a a, a deep dive novel study because they were like, well, I always want to take notes, but yet, like, if you look at a margin on a typical book, like, for a person who has any kind of orthographic issues, like, they can't get their hand to make notes small enough to fit, right. um, and that actually, like, does, it does the trick of both of what they needed. 
And and those are the ones that you put in the um, chat. That's exactly the ones. The that ones you use. Yeah. yeah. And I haven't found anybody anybody doing anything like it. Like there are there are a comp, some that you can buy in like other sets of things, but I haven't found them like. And it's kind of cool that it even it. comes with like a little protective plastic cover, like it looks like a notebook. So like for those kids that you know, maybe shove pla uh, regular post-it notes in like their bags and they get all squished before they can even get to using it. I like the fact yeah, that- Yeah, it's like a I, notebook I that has things within it. It just came yeah. and I was like all excited about it. Yeah, it's a really cool little thing. Now, I mean, I don't know why post-it note doesn't make something similar. You should talk to your people. I am gonna talk to my people, my people just in IT, so I don't think you have any <laughs> <laughs> But I'll talk this to my people. This could be his moment to bust out of a, a IT into the creative side. So I'm sure they could make something more, better, different, other, you know. Oh, Marada, you have that mobile van where you were making stuff. Come on. Just make post-it notes. I'm make thinking about just sit, I'm sitting over here and I'm just going to cut little tabs into the post-it notes <laughs> on my nice. desk. That's what I'm going to work on. And then now Mike, use it. <laughs> Mike, use a 3D printer with erasable materials. There, there it is, yeah. Go. I feel like I could easily make that high tech. I think it would be very soothing to sit here all day with a pair of pa uh, scissors and just out. cut out tabs in this pet in this post-it notepad. That might be a good if, use of my time. If that works for you, then, then go for it. <laughs> that is a good thing. I'll send you sure. a pod book or two to cut. There you go. I was going to say, if you really want to cut tabs, the pod books are a great way to spend your time doing that. Yeah. over um, and over. maybe i don't want to do that okay. okay guys i have a question about tabs and like i'm trying to organize this um like survey and i did it in google forms and it's like so long how do i do it digitally like what do i how do i like condense it because it's about aac competencies and like i need five different areas but like it's just so long. you have are you using the little sections where it jumps to another section yeah in Google Forms? No, tell me about that. I need that. <laughs> no, it doesn't have to be one continuous scroll. Yeah, so yeah. it's it's kind of like, um, uh, like if you wanted to write a choose your own adventure, it gives you the ability to do that. But if you go in and I don't even know that I have a form open. I, I just stopped please. sharing in case you felt okay. like you had a form. Um, let me see if I've got one that will work for what I have. Um, yeah, this will work. It's not really what I want, but it'll work. Um, let me find the right screen. All right. So this is my Google form as it would be seen by somebody else. This is just, you know, trying to track my own thing. If I go in to edit it, when you're in edit, there's a couple different things I would do. And you guys tell me if you want something different. So you can add sections, Lauren. So if you add a section to it, it basically breaks it, breaks that survey up. So, and then you tell it, okay, after they finish this first section, what happens? Mm -hmm. um, and then you, you can also do all kinds of fancy things. Like if they answer yes to this question, it sends them to this other section and not this section. So I would do that, that header. And then the other thing you can also do is add a title area. So if you're breaking it up to where like you want to tell people whether it's, it's if it's like a section, but then you really do need a title underneath it. Um, I will sometimes embed a video if sometimes if I'm doing a survey that's semi long, and sometimes it's like a funny video that's just like, take a minute and do it. But the sections, I think, um, give you the ability. So now that I have, let's see, let me break this up again. Um, now that I have like multiple sections, you, what happens on their screen is they don't see the whole continuous form. They see I'm like a continue, there. they see like a continue button. So to me, it's a little bit of a mental trick because yeah. like you may be asking them the same content, but it's like, answer these two questions. And then so if I go into preview mode, what they see is, okay, the very beginning of the form, and obviously I put a section in a weird place, but then they see a next, and then they see whatever the other question is, and then they see a next, and then they see the bulk of whatever, and then maybe they get to a submit. So if you're breaking it up, I did that for the, I did a, a Google form version of the, oh gosh, the ACE Center's um, Pragmatic 
whatever, whatever for AAC users, I, pragmatic profile for AAC users. I did that as a Google form for a client of mine. And that's how I did it was I used headers and sections and that way. Um, and, and for another, another of those forms in that same one, it was like, does your student have a you know concern in this area? Well, if they hit no, they, then I can send them to a section like section four, if they don't need to fill out section three. You know what I mean? So it saves them a little bit of time. And the the conditional answer is exactly like Cassie was saying. I think that's a huge thing because then you can basically direct them and tell them, okay, if they answer what, you know, yes to this question or no to this question, um, I use that when I was getting teletherapy information from people like, okay, yeah. do you, you know, are you interested in teletherapy services? Well, if they say no, I'm not going to ask them what materials they have in their house for teletherapy because they just told me they don't want it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That helps so much because I was doing it. I know how to do it in Qualtrics, which I used in like other research surveys and things, but I was like, this is getting a little unruly. And I was working with a family. Um, we have some, some family members that are starting to work with us on this, um, on our, um, in different subgroups and this mom was like well i'll just put everything in here and i was like okay yeah dump it in there and then i'll figure out I forgot how to do it yeah. yeah i mean it works that way and one of the things google just announced they're going to do is is have the ability for you to save your drafted forms so like think a student is working on a quiz they don't have to do it all in one sitting then yeah. they can save it and go back and do it um and the beta for that is already out and it should be fully released like end of march so um, that's Absolutely. another thing. Again, not for a student. I would use yeah. that if a parent, I'm like, hey, look, no pressure. Don't do this all in one sitting, right. come back to it. But previously I was using Jot form for stuff like that because it had some other features. But um, I like using the section and the conditional answers because then they don't get bogged down with things that don't matter to them. And you get the information. It just makes it look quicker. I've, okay. I've also so done that with like on my strand, like how do you, um, so I want like a visual display of this, mm -hmm. but um, what we're doing, cause you guys answer all my life questions. <laughs> yes. Um, so I have this and, and it's like, um, here, I'm going to put in the, um, in the chat. So it's like this um, web and like, I want the visual display to look like this because they're non-linear skills. Like when you're talking about AAC mm -hmm. competencies, like you can be really high in operational, but like not as high in strategic and like for goal planning and stuff. I want people to see that and how that kind of like moves around in a web, but mm -hmm. not linear. So mm -hmm. if you do it in Google form, then what would you suggest? Like, how could I like link it to something? I, we have a lot of tools that we're already using in our school division and we have like really robust tools, but I'm like, we have 365, we have Google, we have so many things. I'm like, I just want to do it in something that we already have and not use like this fusion charts was really cool. But then I'm like, well, that's just something else. So what you're wanting is an image that then could be interactive. Yeah, or like a visual display. So think about like um, how the communication matrix, how you can you can save one and then you can update it and has those little blocks. Mm -hmm. And then you can see the progress if you print it out or you can see different sort of like time stamped ones. I would like something like that, but communication matrix is like more linear. It's like as you move down and then left to right, you get more complex sort of skills. But so what you want them to, you want Not really <laughs> I mean the four yeah. areas all themselves we could do through that another time but that's true true yeah yeah so is this what you want winter skills like a little differently yeah is this what you want the outcome of the form to be like or is this totally separate from that google form um the visual display for the yeah. google form like the visual display, I, I guess maybe, maybe somebody else understands. And I don't like, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to visualize your end product. And I'm, I am. I was just going to jump in. Like, I, think, I think you're sort of like what Alyssa was saying with the end product. Um, like you can import all of that Google form into a sheet. And then from sheets, you can do all sorts of charts sorts of and, things. and things um, to help you get like, more visual representation. Yeah, if you just want visual data. representation of your data, I would use Google Data Studio. And even though if you're, like, you're having a student fill out that form, let's say you want those competencies 
and you want to track it over time, you would have a separate sheet then for each student. And then that sheet you can track over time. So let's say um, you're looking at you know, various different competencies. If you do that in a table, you can see as those competencies build over time, if they keep repeatedly filling out that sheet as you're assessing skills. Different tabs, yeah. Yeah, and I would totally look at Google Data Studio, which I just put a link in there, which basically is okay. like a quick and easy way to take whatever might be in sheets or other places and make it pretty, like prettier mm -hmm. than the charts and graphs and things that you can do in sheets. Um, if, especially if you're wanting to compare, you know, like a pretest, post test, or like a measure of, you know, or you want to look at subgroups and say, here are all the elementary parents that filled something out, and here are all the middle school parents that filled something out. Um, and that, I mean, that to me, that's, I know, I, I don't, I think Microsoft has something similar if you're, if you're wanting to stay in Office 365 lands, but if you have access to Google to do Data Studio, it's, um, it's, I think it's very user friendly on the, on the user end. I don't know, Mike, have you used data studio at all? No. Okay. This is super helpful. It was like me and a parent and one SLP that was working on this. And I was like, I know these answers are out there. I just, I, I didn't know who to ask. So I did know who to ask. <laughs> it just wasn't somebody that was on this committee. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you guys. That's really helpful. I think it's really tricky. I know I've talked to this group about it before, but it's it's really tricky and and there's a really big push that people want to have these like competencies. And I'm like, I just don't like calling them competencies. Like it makes it sound like you master it or you don't. And it's just like, it's a, pro it's a process and it's like a journey of, you know, but they want to be able to write better IEP goals and families want to advocate for work across multiple areas and not just like in linguistic well, with the SLP. They want to have something about strategic competence and other things on their child's IEP. And I get that. And I think that's really important too. So um, just trying to figure that out. Kelly, um, how did they intertwine the competencies in the communication matrix? Do you know? I mean, I know you worked with them a I mean, little bit. As far bit. as how the programming is done? Well, not necessarily the programming, but like, um, is there a way from the communication matrix to make, draw parallels to the areas of the competencies that they have weaknesses in? Well, if you go into the report mode, it helps you pull those things to get out of the matrix into the report. That's the one thing they have a, ch well, now they've changed their fee structure. Yeah. Yeah, but, and um, we have access to them. I just don't know that I, how how best to take that data and then like like she's like Lauren's wanting like to say okay, so because of this this and this, their strength is in strategic, but we really need to work on you know linguistic or whatever. I don't know that it's as clean as I'd like it to be. I get that question a lot. People say like, here's the communication matrix. How can I, what should I do? I'm like, well, you have to use your synthesis and analysis skills to look at it. Like if you haven't taught core words, like come and look, how can you get somebody else's attention? And so like, sometimes it's about having those discussions. Um, and I'm like, well, yeah, your student can't exactly make progress in areas like that, like gaining somebody else's attention if you haven't given them opportunities. So Sometimes we have to dig a little bit deeper on that, but um, some are better than others, I think, in sort of like, what does this mean for this student? Right, and that's when I go and I use the custom form, um, custom, custom reports or custom reports? Custom yeah, the custom reports, okay. because it does help people pull information together. And then once they've done that once or twice, they're able to do it on their own. At least the people that we had in the study down in Chicago were. That's hopeful. Yeah. <laughs> but it does help you go through. I'm trying to pull one up and my login's not working. That's always how it happens for me. It's like, let yeah. me show you this. Oh, wait, I have to reset my password. Yeah. My problem is I have too many passwords in the communication matrix from all the different projects. You have multiple identities. <laughs> 
All right, keep talking. I'll find it. <laughs> while, while Kelly's pulling that up, are you guys finding you need to spoon feed? I'm getting a lot more privileged people I'm working with or me, that's maybe not the word, but they want me to do everything for them and to spoon feed them. They want goals. They want, I, I, I tweeted Mike the other day. I saw someone post on one of the, the Facebook groups that they wanted an AT goal bank. Yeah. And, uh, and it Hillary was just, just like, Hillary turned her microphone on and she's ready to preach. Let's go. Please hey, hold on to your hat. I'm so, I'm so done. No, yeah. I'm, I'm saying like, it's a team effort, right? So it's a team process. It's supposed which, to be. Which yes, but here we go. The, the team needs to have some ownership and responsibility on the implementation. Yeah, of course. We can help oversee that and provide some coach, coach, coach. Exactly, Lauren. And so that's a good coachable moment. What would be a good, I tend to kind of, so what would be a good goal for this child? What do you think? I mean, those are those things we always do. Or like the coaching tactics, like the Google, you know, some of us are studying for the Google coach, which is very, very appropriate for this situation in that kind of questioning protocol. But there has to be some sort of, it's more entitlement, or at least from my experience, to me, it's felt more about a sense of entitlement or that, right, Mike, those questions, like keep asking, get to the heart of that that quick goal bank doesn't really personalize anything for that child that's using AT. That's what goals are. They're personalized. So, you know, it, there, I know it's really crappy times right now. Trust me. Um, but I think that's it. You hit it right there. It's crappy times. And excuse my French. We're like, no, it's true. Learning. It's really hard. And they're really stressed. And when they say, I want the goal bank, they're like, the demands are on me. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't have the time to get to something that. back out. That but I think if, if you can coach, like make it a coachable moment, I mean, Mike's right. got three tips and tricks about coaching through and those questioning strategies and active listening is going to be really important. Yeah, well. I, I totally agree with you and I'm on that soapbox with you. I've, I'm just I've, used, finding Google, a, I've used Google Forms. But a lot of the but a lot of the new speech grads that I'm coming across that are coming out of NYU, not well, not only there, I don't want to name specific schools, but um I'm Everywhere. just finding that they they want the app to they, they are they're coming to our district. I want seven hundred dollars worth of speech apps and I want these subscriptions. Because they don't, but they have a, a storage room of speech pathology materials and books and resources, but they want, they, they don't see the value in it and they just want it all done for them through the apps and they want the report generator to, to write their, you know, PLS or whatever, you know, it's, it's mind boggling to me, but well, maybe I'm too old now. Comment. What's the prep behind it and also tool the task, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm laughing at Mike's comments because I had this discussion um, with the faculty at UVA when I was on faculty there and, and they were like, oh, they just want this. And I was like, I think it's because they're really green and they're really used to getting an answer right away. Yes. And this they have to like analyze and think. a little bit harder right, and think. And think. Yeah. Use your professional judgment. That happens a lot, even with people that are a little that are still kind of seasoned, but they're so overwhelmed because of the procedural and the paperwork burdens and all of the things of case management as a speech path and all of the requirements that districts put on top of you that kind of actually take away from your professional judgment of what do I need to do? How do I need to do it? And how do I help support this kid with the tools that I have? Right, and, right. and so that kind of gets lost. And then you add everything else that's going on in the world on top of it. And you had COVID on top of it. Well, you got some people that are, you know, ready to just throw it, throw in the towel and be done because it's not been easy and it hasn't been impactful. So I think that why do they want a gold bank? What's the purpose of the gold bank? How would this help kids access CT better or access services better by having a gold bank? What is that? And that's, you're right, Karen. That's a good point. The learners need to be a part of the conversation yeah. as well because it's about what do they want and need. And that's a process that sometimes gets lost because apparently other things are more important than actually involving a learner in the process. So yeah. Yeah. I think and it I always goes back. It always goes back to this idea of reminding people that AT is specialized to that person. Mm -hmm. And again, that's what I said to Lori when we were going back and forth. A goal bank is broad. It's cookbook approach to things. And that's not the way we come up with solutions. I think it's a gigantic mind shift for people to think like, 
I need to, again, start with that student in mind and figure out what are the, what are the things that they need, like walking through that set process. They, I, I feel like, cause we have that same problem here, Lori, with new grads of, of, of two different reasons. I think one is that they're used to a plus B equals C, you know, when you go through school, you're, you're programmed to like, look at a problem in a lot, you know, find the solution. Um, and I think in terms of what we do, it is not a, a plus B equals C kind of scenario. You know, it is, it is anything but a, a nice, pretty math equation to get, to get learners to a tool that works with them. And I think it's also, you know, I think our, our new grads are terrified of being wrong terrified of screwing up, terrified Mm -hmm. of, and, and I think sometimes that's where, I mean, honestly, like, I think the most effective thing I've done is model screwing up. (laughs) I'll tell you as a leader, like as a former um, admin district administrator, that was like one of the biggest things is that I felt like I had some real power was to, to, to own when you're wrong and to own how to grow from it. I, I know our school district, which is a massive school district with probably, you know, 200 SLPs at least in it, um, resisted, and I think is continuing to resist for years having a goal bank for SLPs, having a goal bank, uh, same thing I think with special ed, for exactly those reasons of like, this is individualized, we cannot be cookie cutter. And furthermore, you actually hold yourself liable if parents got together and compared. Now, I know when I wrote goals, yes, I did a lot of copying and pasting and all of that, but it would become very quickly evident if you were using a goal bank and then you really, so that's another thing to kind of, you know, help guide people is, you know, we don't want parents to have a perception that we are using a goal bank. We want to be able to take, you know, from them, um, you know, their ideas a- as well and, and to not have this be cookie cutter. I-, I think it's, I think it is balancing the very real hard work and time consuming nature of writing an IEP with looking at what is appropriate for every individual child. And so it ends up being a mix, like, right? You're gonna end up with your own personal goal bank, but it shouldn't be identical to what every other um, professional is, is using. And, and, and that's, a hard, that's a hard thing to figure out. And the workload and- is crazy. I mean, I'm sorry, the, you know, I, God love every one of you that is, you know, out there in the schools now because the, the multitude of what you have to do around IEP work is ridiculous. And I, I'm being in the schools, like I, I see it this year, there's a very big shift, you know, for our teachers in terms of what the expectations are. And I think everybody is just feeling very overwhelmed. And so, you know, for the teachers that there's a little bit of pushback or a little bit of resistance where they don't want to take the accountability and take on that role, you know, I've found two things that I've done where sometimes I bypass them. You know, I'm like, you know what, forget about the teacher. I just go to the kid. Like, you know, I just want to work with the student directly. And, you know, if I know that this is not somebody who's going to do their part and be able to pull the weight, well, then I need to more so than ever, you know, make sure the parents are trained, make sure the student is trained, Um, you know, but also maybe, and this is different than like, you know, new teachers who just don't want to do anything. But, um, you know, but also breaking things off into smaller pieces and saying like, right, maybe this is overwhelming for them too, because tech is not always intuitive for everybody, you know, and that goes for the adults that we're working with too. So I think that has to be taken into consideration is sometimes, you know, I'm working with a new teacher and, you know, just because they're young and they're new doesn't mean that they're adept in the technology. And so, you know, sometimes taking a step back and being like, you know what, just the same way I would do with my students, I wouldn't throw everything in the kitchen sink at them. You know, I kind of do that approach as well to the teachers and make it a very safe place. I'm the only person in my entire district, you know, that does my position. So going and approaching them in a method of like, listen, this is a safe place to make those mistakes. Like somebody, I think Mike was saying there, somebody was saying that in the chat, you know, to make those mistakes and it's okay, you know, to come to me and ask me for guidance if you're a little bit stuck or, you know, to not feel judged if I do check in and you really haven't done everything you were supposed to be doing, you know, because 
you don't want them to not be honest about what's happening as well. You know, I don't know. And I think we've, we've found success with some of those newer therapists doing the, the, I do, we do, we do kind of scenario of, of gradual release. The same thing we would do with our students is like, okay, you're really struggling with how to write goals for the student. Let's talk about the student. I'm going to help you craft that goal. Like I'm going to pretty much do the writing of the goal for this student when that student's, you know, next annual review comes around or it's another student with a similar set of needs, like write the goal and then I'm going to give you feedback about it and be like, hey, have you thought about using this wording or whatever? That way, when we come to that third ideation of their working with a specific student with a specific kind of need, they really can do it on their own. Um, and, and I feel like that way, it's not like try it and, and if you fail, then I'll help you. It's like, I'm going to coach you along in that very beginning portion. And like, maybe it's just your, you know, you don't know what, what are the right words to use in this district? Cause you know, every district has a different, like a, you know, do you start the IEP goal with by the end of the IEP period? Do you specify this way? Do you specify that way? And I think sometimes when they're like, I don't know how to write a goal or I want a bank, it's because they don't know those specifics. And like, they're thinking, oh, if I screw that up, like, it doesn't matter what I write in the goal. Cause they're going to say it's in the wrong format yeah which goes to brian's comment in the chat which is awesome brian hey i didn't even know you were here it's good to see you um but brian's right i, I think the part that i struggle with is that term gold bank just makes me start to cringe a little bit just makes me tense up look i even just made a fist i don't even know why i don't even know what i'm gonna do but i just it it's just like ugh, i don't like that but i like the idea what brian said this idea of templates and it's exactly what Alyssa just said it gives guidance of how we put those things together. And then you layer into it your professional understanding of what that student needs. Maybe that in itself makes it easier for people. Uh, I, instead of, you know, student will do blah, 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 whatever you write, I give some suggestion of how it should look. But then it goes back to that asking questions constantly. It's the questions. Well, and, and I think, yeah, learner. I think for a lot of time, a lot of times when I get that hesitant IEP writer who is asking, like, can't you just give me some example goals? That's usually how they ask because they know how I feel about a bank, um, you know, and when I really nail, you know, tear down to what's really going on, it's they're either uncomfortable with the text, so they don't know how to phrase it. And they're afraid, okay, if I write this goal and I write it wrong, well, I'm still held accountable for measuring it and following that data. So like, I really got to know like how I'm writing that goal. And again, it usually comes back to, why don't I come and spend a little time with you on co-writer, snapper, whatever it is that thing is that they really, because it's usually not about how do I phrase the goal. Once you've given them the guide of like, it's, it's really their discomfort with how do I implement it? Yeah. I yes. Agree. I had somebody ask me the other exactly. day, I think it's just exactly that. And especially when it's like a little out of the box, which is our whole field, like everything we do is out of the box. Like they were asking me about reading decoding and they're like, well, how does shared reader go in with reading decoding? I'm like that reading decoding and reading comprehension, like you have to work on the foundation skills. So you have to engage in dialogic reading and shared reading experiences, build that around books before you can even get any engagement. Like this student isn't coming over to books. That's reading comprehension. Like it's okay to write a goal for that, but they see that heading and they see like reading comprehension. I need to have them show understanding of beginning, middle and end of the story because that's like a kindergarten standard. And they're not thinking of like what goes into that before that power standard at kindergarten. And they need permission to say like, it's okay that one year's growth and one year's time is really starting to come over and finding books that work with this student. Like if they're not even doing books at all, how can you have reading comprehension if they're not picking up or engaging in any reading opportunity with you? So, and that so, method of access and literacy, like even thinking what is reading and what does that look, sound and feel like? And what are the different, I mean, we could go down a whole rabbit hole here with yes. that, but that's such a good point, Lauren. And that has anyone ever remembered, I remember getting trained 
this is back in the dark ages in Massachusetts when I taught in Lawrence, well, we unpacked standards at the time. And then what we did, because I was, I was actually a facilitator for um, the first round of the alternate assessment. And one of the things we did was we looked at the standards, and we unpacked them and we, and we had access standards. So we knew what language of the standard that child could successfully access and use that to write our goal. And I still do that because I'm looking at the standard and it might be reading, like you said, Lauren, it's reading comprehension. Well, the first step to that is, like you said, accessing a book and opening it like there it is. So that's the goal. And so I'm wondering for those that are in higher ed that are maybe teaching higher ed like, or undergrad, not just, you know, graduate courses, but the undergrads, are we doing that work with teachers? Mm -hmm. Is that still happening? Are we, because I'm thinking about the goal book. So why do you want a goal bank if you don't know how to break apart a goal or to tweak or modify or adapt, or as you said, think differently um, in that aspect and that that's okay to do that because we need it to be quantified, but we need it to be specific for that student. That's why it's an IEP. So I'm just wondering if that pendulum, as we talked about in education that goes this way, this way, this mm. way, this way, this way, we're all hanging on like, wah, when is it just going to settle and we're just going to like, okay, this is it. And not just this way, but you know what I mean? It's just, I always think about that. Do people have that knowledge of unpacking a goal? Yeah. So I really don't think that our institutions down here are doing that based on the new grads coming into us. And when we do quality IEP training and when we do our access points, which is our, our standards for our kids, um, um, with significant disabilities, when we do that training, it's sometimes that like light goes on and I'm like, what were you doing? And I mean, I know what they were doing in undergrad, but like, wh why didn't some of that critical thinking skill get taught as we're producing them as educators? Because you could be wrong and nobody wants to be wrong. It's the same thing. If people knew how wrong I was every single day, like how many times I tried something and I'm like, well, that was a total bomb. Like, yeah. I think that's our profession. Like if you can't, you got to be comfortable with not having an answer immediately and be willing to screw up. Like when people yeah. ask me like, what, you know, what do you, what do you, you know, what's your like core advice for somebody being an AT specialist? Like, yeah, be willing to ask other people for help because you're not going to have the answers and be willing to mess up more than you get it right. Yeah, and if I could piggyback off that, Alyssa, um, during the Cami Connect virtual conference, Jerry Brooks spoke at the beginning. I don't know if any of you saw that or not, but he talked a lot about professional jealousy. And I think because of that exists so heavily that oftentimes I feel like people are afraid to say that they were wrong because they don't want, you know, they want to look like, I don't know, it's just, instead of saying, I really messed up. How did you do that to make, make yourself successful? We just kind of hold that in and not say because of that professional jealousy. Mm -hmm. And it's such a disservice to ourselves when we're kind of hold that. Um, yeah. If you didn't always, get a chance to do, be, to see the Cami one, go back and, and watch it and specifically watch uh, Hillary be a rock star in her segment. Um, was it recorded? Cause I had signed up. Yeah. I didn't have time. And I love Gary Brooks. Yeah. Uh, Hillary, do you have the link? For yep, the, there, I'll, I'll put them in the chat. There's a link to the actual session without the Q&A, but you can re-watch the okay. live with the Q&A, which I actually, I while well, my presentation was fine, I actually think the Q&A was better than the actual It, it was so, great, Hillary. Hillary. It was wonderful. You but yeah, the Q&A was really, it was fun. You so I have, a deep, I have a deep question that I hope you all can answer. Is it Jerry or is it Gary Brooks? Yeah. <laughs> Gary. Tomato okay. yeah. There was conversation Gary. in the background. Is it Gary or Jerry? Because I kept saying. And it is pronounced Gary. And I only know that because I actually saw him live a couple years ago. And he like said that during his session or something like that. Yeah. And then there was a discussion. Is it Kami or Cami? Because Hillary, of course, is Kami. I say Cami. Yeah. I say and Cami too. The company says Kami though. Well, then it would be Kami. But I can't buy into that. Sorry. Those leaders are a hoot. I love them. They're so much fun. And they're very responsive. I, I talked to the CEO because there's still some accessibility like hiccups like from like screen readers and keyboard nav, but they're working on their WCAG AAA. So they are actively working on that because um, I always ask the question. I said, so you had some updates. What about accessibility updates, Angie? He's like, I knew you were going to ask. So here it is. And I'm, I'm very pleased with their response. And also whiteboard chat. 
I'm very yeah, pleased with their responsiveness to I accessibility. I don't know what it is lately and what has turned the tide, but there's a series of companies, Whiteboard Chat being one, Kami be another, that it's like instantaneously really responsive. And sometimes their answer is, we don't have that, but we're working on it. And I, I'll take that answer. And again, modeling answer. not where we yeah. are, right. but like the fact that we're, I mean, whiteboard.chat has been amazing and responsive and like in the stuff that, that you, that if you're not following them on Twitter, that they were not necessarily originally like thinking, let's use this for education. And as people were seeing it and seeing it, seeing it, the things that they have added Mm -hmm. to make people's life easier and they have signed everybody's super stringent policies for privacy so you know if um if any um if anybody is like like they signed california and new york and someplace else that is like notoriously really hard to get people to get approved for for privacy so um i i have been really impressed that so i don't know what it is i don't know if like there's i'm hoping there's like a tide shift happening where people where accessibility is not just this fad thing, but they're really, uh, they're really wanting to to design from a UDL space. Um, but the fact that people yeah. are super responsive, um, it just has been very positive. So this is probably not by a popular opinion, but I have had problems with the whiteboard chat. Like, I haven't found it user friendly, and maybe it's just me. Like something's going on, um, but I do love it, and I've been trying it. And I, I wanted to try it the other day, but I just couldn't get it to go. So I need to look at it more. But one thing we should, if, if, like if one of you are communicating with them in their default settings, they have the immersive reader set as a default. But if they had the text to speech as a default and some of those accessibility settings already checked, because I think going into the settings, I kind of struggle with even finding them. I don't know why, I don't know what the problem is. Just maybe it's just that we- I would, so I had some of that problem initially when I was like looking and playing and I was like, whoa, like this is a, there's a lot in mm -hmm. there. Um, and there are a couple of really great videos. I'll, I'll like either uh, retweet them on Twitter or send them to you. I think I just, I went in and spent like a good 30 minutes mm -hmm. with their video on one screen and my having whiteboard chat up on another. And I was like, oh like i get it good idea um so i think that spending a little bit more time might help and there are some things that they are pretty openly aware like hey that's kind of clunky we don't really like how this is working or that is working um but i i they have been incredibly quick to respond yeah. and be like hey let's change this or like i want to know more about why that would be helpful, um, which usually IT programmer people are not about the why, they're about the function. So I think that part of it is nice. I agree. They were very responsive with my, I mentioned them on Twitter with the issue I was having with Mercer Reader, and then they said, send me an email. And I emailed them what the issue was with the, the actual source document, and then they were done. That's right. Awesome. And it was like really cool. Like the next thing within two hours, they're like, so we added editable immersive reader. And I was like, my head literally, Mike, <laughs> you know, you're a visual person. My head literally was like, like literally the brain exploding thing just totally happened. And I was like, I've never had that kind of response from a company wow. about a feature ever. And they were trying to get micro, I mean, Karen Feller was talking about, I've been trying to get Mike Tuffelson to add that in immersive reader for years for Microsoft and that had, and they just said, what? <laughs> like, yep. And it works and it's great. And so there are things, okay, Kelly, I agree that are clunky. Some of the math stuff's a little clunky, but the webinar I was on with them, they had said that that's something they're actively working on. They know it, they're working on it. Yeah. They're also angel funded. So it's not that they have an infinite revenue stream and they want to make it free, like for life. Like they don't want it to just be free. And then they explode and go, oh, sorry, we're going to charge you now. Like they're really committed to keeping this free and accessible, totally accessible. Yeah, I know our time is like, it's 105, but just really quickly, um, I saw somewhere, I don't know if it was on Twitter, but educators, because whiteboard chat is free, which is amazing, right? But teachers were creating things and putting it on teachers paid teachers. And like, that's not right, right? Like I didn't that's feel good right. about, okay. And I was like, uh, no, no, that's super sad because they're doing all of this work and I can see how responsive they are mm -hmm. in. Okay. Go with your initial gut feeling. People yeah. are not cool sometimes. Don't get me started on the whole teachers pay teachers. Uh, 
No. Yeah, uh, I cleaned started. up my statement of what I was going to say. I said they're just <laughs> not cool sometimes. But you, anybody who knows me, put in the we, words we I really was going to say there. Yeah. That could be another session at some conferences, 101 Reasons Not to Use Teachers Pay Teachers. Anybody <laughs> in? Let's do it. I'm serious. Let's go. Yeah. Now, I, what I, I, conference I, I, would be brave enough to take that on. say yes to that presentation. Mike, Mike Morata's conference. Yeah. He's gonna That's right. right. I would. Yes. Yeah, I'm happy. Yeah. If you want to run that as a webinar, I would host that. What the heck? I don't care. Let's do it. Who wants so, in? Do you find boom out. cards on that same level? Yeah. Do you close. find boom cards close? Because I that's. It depends on the. It depends, depends on, on how they're being used. It depends yeah. on how they're being used. Some of the same issues such as intellectual property rights um, and the lack of, uh, some of the intellectual property rights and the lack of, you know, how it's being, I mean, that being said, like, right, like I work for Lesson Picks and Lesson Picks has a sharing center, but that's different. Like you're going in there, you're not, it's part of your subscription. Right. Nobody's making money. And that's part of the issue. Hi is everyone and Lesson welcome Picks. to our session, Access. Oh. Lesson picks. Finds, I mean, I'm always finding lesson picks on teachers pay teachers and in boom cards and it is it's there's not permission to do that. That's a violation of their user agreement. So there's a lot of people out there. There's also an incredible uh, a lot of things that uh, perpetuate bad practice practices and yeah. stereotypes bad practice. And, and to me, that's the thing. It's like, you can find a really pretty activity, but like, if it's not actually accomplishing a goal or linked to standards or like, especially for kids who have more significant disabilities linked to a research-based practice, mm -hmm. like current research-based practice, then we're just showing, we're giving them really pretty activities that maybe they can access and maybe they can't. Right. And I find a lot of times they're not accessible. You know, that's a huge issue on the elementary level yeah. that, you know, the kindergarten teachers, first grade teachers, you know, they want these like pretty lessons that have the funny, you know, I call them the funky fonts, like, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, and then all of our screen readers, nothing works on that. You know, it's right. such an inherent problem. And we use Seesaw and I'm like, stop using teacher pay teachers. Like Seesaw has, and we have Seesaw for school. So we have that's yeah. the library. We have our community library where our own yeah. teachers are shared. I'm like, don't dip out and go someplace else and give somebody money for something when it's all here, you know, and it's much right. more accessible. So it's, yeah, it's problematic. Well, like I'm, an, I'm an amateur photographer and I have thousands and thousands and thousands of my own personal photos that I would love to like get together with someone and create materials. I mean, I make my own materials too, but if anyone's interested in that accessibility side and lining with the standards piece because my ADHD can't handle <laughs> all those pieces. Um, I would love to yeah. pair up with somebody if you're interested, even for a bath that, you know, I don't care to post it for lesson picks for that you guys, because I just have lots of like just natural nature shots and, and just so many that can be used for so many based on all this stuff I've been seeing on Teacher by Teacher and on all these websites and Facebooks that are selling these things. And I felt, I got caught up in the excitement and I bought a few. I'm just like, I mean, yeah. I worked with Carol Gustafson and Caroline Musswhite and Linda for five years way back when. And I know what all that materials, how to make and where, and it's just the quality and it's. Donkey, yeah. And then good stuff by people like Caroline and other people that are gets lost in the shuffle because it's not that everything out there is terrible. It's there are some no stuff. for sure. But it's, there's a lot of good stuff, but there's the also a lot thing, of yeah. The biggest thing that gets me sometimes is just the is the intellectual property piece. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna take this thing that so and so did. Yeah, that is clearly a... copyrighted, yeah. and I'm gonna involve it in my activity, and then I'm gonna sell it for like. And, and it's mine. Yeah, and I'm gonna sell it, or I'm gonna I'm gonna do something that somebody else has done, but not attribute it to that person or honor right. that person, and just make right. it like it's mine. And I have that idea. And I'm so smart, and I don't like that. That just reeks of yes. yuckiness. Because that me. is a that is what we would call a garbage person. That was that's just <laughs> dishonoring. <laughs> You got thing, it. Though, but do you, but some people might not realize it and they might just be so oblivious yeah. that what they're doing is wrong as well because we're not taught that. Yeah, I think right. there are some people who absolutely are oblivious and I think there are some people who are absolutely intentional. Yeah. Yes. 
So there are garbage people and then there are clueless, not yeah. really garbage people. Yeah, they're still garbage. All right, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> Yeah. Please let that be the last thing we talk about. I just like that I got the word garbage, garbage people, people in twice. So, <laughs> And all I think about when I think about garbage people is Sesame Street. So, <laughs> Well, now I just have this Bitmoji meme thing that Kelly's going to make of all of us like in garbage cans. And we're all just garbage people. That's what I, I, I would happily put that on my grid, <laughs> on my wall. Garbage Our little people. virtual meeting space. There we are. like garbage <laughs> people. Yes. We're just garbage pale AT people. Just garbage people. <laughs> all right, everyone. Final words before we let everybody go now that it's 112. Final words. I think we just said it all. We are we did it all. people, apparently. We did it all. All right. Maybe we'll play next week. Fingers crossed. Maybe we will. Maybe we will see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be ready to play just in case. We'll see. So yeah. hopefully. All right, guys. Have, have a good, good week. week. Make it great. See you guys later.